Hi everybody, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack and Turn. I hope that you're doing well. I hope that the month of September is starting well for you, that you're safe. Uh, I know there's a lot going on in many different parts of the world, so I do hope that you're well, that you're safe. Uh, thankfully we are, uh, my wife is, my daughter's not even with school starting and the pandemic's still definitely occurring. Uh, we've all been able to stay safe and so I really hope that you are. And with the end of August and the beginning of September, it is time for my August Marginalia video, my monthly Marginalia, where I discuss short stories, poems, essays, whole books, that I read in the past month and didn't do any videos about. And, uh, and then a couple of quick musical recommendations at the end, all of which are inspired by my wonderful wife. So let's jump into some stories to start out. We've got Tatiana Tolstoya. Yes, related to that Tolstoy. And I think probably most famous for The Slinks, a very strange book. Uh, but she's a great short story writer. And there are um, many stories in this volume that my wife and I have both enjoyed. But this past month I read uh, Yorick. Yes, referencing that Yorick. From Hamlet uh, and of course the the moment where Hamlet finds the skull and, and recalls York and it has sort of this meditation on mortality which is what a good portion of Hamlet is <laughs> but um, this was a very interesting take uh, and, and an interesting meditation and musing on on mortality uh, from uh, Tatiana Tolstoy and it was a story I highly recommend perfect segue into shake tempo um, then, from Havana Noir, a uh, great collection of Cuban short stories set in Havana, and primarily in more modern Havana, the past 30-ish uh, years. Uh, and, and as with all the noir, city noir collections, some are hit or miss, but I found two very solid ones this past month. Uh, the Scene from Milene Fernandez Pintado, which was very good, and The Orchid, which was powerful and, and shivering and just... <laughs> Very, very intense, uh, from Mariela uh, Verona Roque. And each story really presented, you know, just really two characters, you know, the, the sort of two characters in a room type situation where you just have a real sense of personality and authenticity and the emotion, the pain that comes in human existence. And I deeply enjoyed both. One of the things I've discovered from this volume is how underread Cuban literature is. And I, I there's a variety of reasons for that, I'm sure. Uh, but what, one of the things I found is there's a whole bunch of Cuban books that have never been translated into English. Uh, just never have been translated as, as I've been doing some research. And hopefully that will change because it, many of them even predate uh, the Cuban Revolution. And so there's books from the 30s and 40s that I would, I'm would i very interested in exploring. More on that in a tag coming up in the next month. From the Penguin Book of Japanese Short Stories, inspired by some great videos from the Codex Cantina, we had In the Box, uh, which was a reread for me. I had read that earlier this year, and I really enjoyed that story um, on a reread. I, I, it's an interesting story uh, <laughs> that captures a little bit. That's from Kono Taiko. And then I really, really deeply enjoyed The Tale of the House of Physics from Yoko uh, Ogawa. And that was a powerful story and definitely makes me want to read more from Ogawa, more of her... Her book's probably The Memory Police. Um, let's see, from Shirley Jackson's Dark Tales edition, uh, I read Jack the Ripper, which is a very bizarre story in which a person seems to be, you know, really alert. Hey, 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 somebody needs help. Somebody needs help. Somebody needs help. And then there's a bizarre twist to that. So I'll just leave it there. It's almost The Bad Samaritan. This should be a subtitle for it. Uh, I jumped back into Joy Williams, who's always a delight. And I was specifically inspired by reading uh, Naya Marie Eitz, Baboon, and the short stories in there. And I went, oh, okay, this is a Joy Williams. I want to jump over and, and read some Joy Williams. Like, that's who I'm reminded of. That's almost like the number one short story writer I'm reminded of. Uh, so I read uh, Shorelines, a very strong story, and one of many excellent stories in this specific volume, Taking Care, one I highly recommend. Um, from Whatever Happened to Interracial Love by Kathleen Collins, another absolutely fantastic writer. I read The Uncle, and I don't think that's the strongest story. I think uh, exteriors and interiors are very strong um, opening stories in this volume, and it goes into many more that are excellent. The Uncle is a good story. Um, it, it is firmly a good story. Uh, I sort of returned to a book that I've been reading on and off for almost a year now, and that's the different stories that are in Randall Jarrell's book of stories. And... This is a really great anthology. It's one of my favorite short story anthologies as I've been going through it. But um, one of the things he approaches is that Jarrell takes the approach that poems can be short stories. M many different types of works can be short stories. And so some of these aren't actually stories, including The Mental Traveler from William Blake. But it's a narrative poem. 
uh, Rothschild's Fiddle by Chekhov, The Fir Tree by Hans Christian Andersen, The Wrecked House's The Big Thing by Rainer Maria Rilke, and that actually was prose, not poetry, uh, The Book of Jonah, <laughs> The Death of Monsignor by the Duc de Saint-Simon, and that is from his memoirs. So again, not really a short story, but a contained episode. Uh, what You Hear From Him by Peter Taylor, and Gusev by Anton Chekhov, and Gusev was quite strong. Um, and I'm rapidly approaching running out of stories in this anthology, one I dearly love. I did go back over to uh, some Cthulhu Mythos with the Cthulhu 2000 anthology, and I read Pikmin's Modem, not Pikmin's Model, but Pikmin's Modem from Lawrence Watt Evans. It was, it was quite good. <laughs> and then also, uh, gosh, what was it called? I had vacantly crumpled it into my pocket, but by God, Elliot, it was a photograph from, from Life by Joanna Russ, which of course is reference to <laughs> a story, uh, a Pikmin story. From Edgar Allan Poe, William Wilson, that was inspired by reading Dostoevsky's The Double. I acquired the Library of America's Nathaniel Hawthorne Tales and Sketches, and I just started jumping into his early sketches, which are set in colonial uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony, and we see uh, many of them are sketches of the actual historical figures. So we see an early uh, governor and um, Sir William Phipps. Uh, we, we also had Mrs. Hutchinson and Hutchinson, uh, the antinomian, and uh, th these are enjoyable. Hawthorne's fantastic, one of my favorite writers. So uh, Una from Codex Cantina had sent me a message referencing a certain work, <laughs> so I jumped into the Spider's Thread from Ryunosuke Akutagawa and reread that and then was inspired to remember uh, the certain passage in a certain Dostoevsky novel that I think Akutagawa may have had open when he wrote that story. I am continuing to enjoy reading a couple of fairy tales from the Brothers Grimm each month. This past month it was two, The Riddle and The Mouse, the Bird, and the Sausage. Uh, they were both okay. They weren't among my favorite stories, but I'm there are so many good ones in here that I'll be continuing to jump in and out of that volume. And then from Dangerous Visions, when I did my shelf tour, I'd ask, you know, are there any stories that people really enjoy from here? And uh, one commenter had pointed out that there's a very, very good story in here, uh, Shall the Dust Praise Thee by Damon Knight. And so I, I read that, and I thought it was a very effective story. So I'm going to put it out there again. What are other great stories that are in the Dangerous Visions anthology that you're aware of uh, that you think I should pay attention to, pay or pay a reread attention to? <laughs> um, going on to poetry, one of my all-time favorite poets, possibly my, my favorite poet of the 20th century, would be Anna Akhmatova, the great, great Russian poet. And I reread um, Evening, which is her early collection of poems, set re uh, really before World War I, um, in a society that certainly disappears during that war. And this fantastic poet, poetry, even early on. From the excellent Proenza, an anthology of troubadour poetry, I read a set of poems, one from Beatrice de Villa, and another was the was an anonymous troubadour poem that was clearly uh, from the perspective, if not, it was not written by one, it was clearly from the perspective of a, of a woman. And so it was really interesting to kind of focus in on just a couple of the poems in this excellent anthology. I did a video on this in, I want to say January of 2020, and so I'll uh, link that in the description box. This is a volume I highly recommend. Uh, from the Penguin Book of Modern African Poetry, I was reading a few, but one that jumped out was Annette Mbai uh, de Ernval from Senegal. And I also discovered a great, great poem from Sierra Leone that will dovetail perfectly into Sheikh Temper. So look forward to that at the end. <laughs> uh, within the works of the Gawain poet, I took the time to read in Middle English Patience and some commentary on Patience. Uh, the very strange poem. Uh, certainly a didactic religious poem. It's not nearly as enjoyable as you know, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Um, but it's, it's solid. It's a solid poem. It's interesting to see the different sides of that uh, absolutely incredible mind and voice. There were different people talking about Borges, so I was dipping in and out of the uh, poems from Jorge Luis Borges, and uh, I enjoy them. I, I, I certainly put short stories, then the interesting, fascinating, critical essays, uh, and then his poetry. And, and if, if all we had was his poetry, we'd still remember him, 
but it's his short short stories that I think I continue to remember him for. Uh, within the American Religious Poems anthology, I read a number of poems, and uh, my daughters were really enjoying poetry. That's one of our nightly staples. Uh, so, uh, Marion Moore, Eleanor Wiley, Kenneth Rexroth, Rexroth, he had a very strong poem in here. Uh, County Coolin, Langston Hughes, um, what was it, Ann, Ann Brad, Bradstreet? Yeah, Ann Bradstreet. So many, many in this volume. It's, it's one that I have really enjoyed getting into this year. And then from the French poetry volume, uh, Victor Hugo, who's a tremendous poet. And uh, the famous uh, Boaz Dreams poem, which is excellent. Excellent poem. Uh, the whole books, the whole books I read. Absolutely whole books. Maggie, A Girl of the Streets from Stephen Crane. Um, I read this kind of thinking from John Dos Passos as I'd finished the USA trilogy, but also Sanctuary. Uh, which I read and won't discuss more. <laughs> but um, I, I read, reread Maggie, and it was it was solid. It's, it's Stephen Crane's an interest has an interesting perspective. He definitely has a, a specific perspective in much of his writing, particularly uh, the writing that's set there in New York or the writing that's set in the West. There's a very uh, specific like outlook he has on life and on society um, that that comes through in those stories. Um, but I also read an interesting sort of little essay, uh, Above All Things, talking about sort of the attitude of many New Yorkers towards uh, the impoverished who were living in their society. Uh, inspired primarily from H.G. Wells, I reread The Origin of the Species from Charles Darwin. I read a full play by Lady Gregory from the Modern Irish Drama Collection. Uh, the Rising of the Moon, which was interesting. It, it was set with a, a character who essentially is trying to escape um, after something has occurred. And there's a couple of police officers who are looking and, and you know, trying to kind of catch him on a wharf. And it was, it was a strong play. A strong play. And then I started reading uh, Anniversaries by Uwe Johnson, uh, the famous chapter for every day novel, or novels, uh, that's very long. And... Um, really juxtaposes a, 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 a mother in New York City in 1967 and 1968 with her child and their sort of relationship and what's going on in the world, the turmoil of 67 and 68, and the mother thinking back to growing up in Nazi Germany and during World War II and then the Soviet occupation um, of East Germany after World War II. And so her formative years, as her daughter is going through her own formative years, in this new environment. Um, and so far, it, it's been interesting. Uh, it's enjoyable. There's a huge emphasis on the character reading the New York Times frequently, which in 2021 just is almost, it's almost like absurd. Um, but, it's, but it's been enjoyable. I was dipping in and out of Virginia Woolf's Common Reader. This is a great collection of essays, by the way, just in general. Um, but specifically, a couple of essays that I read right here at the end of August were on not knowing Greek, and uh, notes on an Elizabethan play. And the, the, those really focus on sort of, the, this, the, the latter really focuses on the idea of like the vivacity, the, the life and spark that seems to exist on stage in the Elizabethan and Jacobian plays. And not just Shakespeare, but it's really emphasizing other playwrights, um, specifically some of the pre-Shakespearean playwrights and then a post-Shakespearean playwright, John Ford, uh, who's fantastic. Um, this is an interesting volume, When the World Spoke French by Marc Fumaroli, and I was trying to find lots of different pathways into Women in Translation Month, and this ended up being a really interesting nonfiction route because um, the <laughs> it was originally published in French, and so it was about different individuals who were not French primarily, who were writing in French. They learned French to write and correspond, and so it then has translations of their works. Um, and little annotation and, and background and context. And so it's been interesting to read this uh, and, and see the many different voices that pop out. Uh, inspired by reading The Master and Margarita, I continue to pursue the notebooks of Victor Serge, just uh, almost brutally honest, brutal and brutally honest uh, reflections on his life and life really as a failed revolutionary. Uh, also, <laughs> inspired by Master Margarita, uh, I joked in the in the group uh, discussion, but I jumped in and read good portions of Kant's Critique of Practical Reason, as that was discussed. 
Um, as I had mentioned, the nonfiction of Jorge Luis Borges, uh, specifically that discussing Julio Cortazar. And then um, again with those discussions in Master Margarita, uh, there was a there, the second chapter of Master Margarita. If you've never read it, it's excellent. It's a very surreal, strange, um, beautiful story. Uh, but one of the like one of the er, very early chapters, I want to say it's the second chapter, has a character who seems to be the devil talking about um, the day of the crucifixion and and what Pontius Pilate's experience was that day. Uh, in his conversations there in Jerusalem uh, with this carpenter. And one of the uh, sentences, and it really made me think of a specific saying in the Coptic Sayings Gospel of Thomas, discovered in the Nag Hammadi Library uh, in the 20th century, where it talks about uh, specifically like being against um, Matthew and the idea that you know what Matthew's, the sayings Matthew's collecting are different. Uh, and so I jumped in and reread the Sayings Gospel of Thomas. Um, there's also, I think, some overlap in Saying Three and the idea of the poverty of uh, dwelling in a poverty of our own imagination uh, that I found in Kafka on the Shore. So, then uh, the excellent Pillar of Fire by Taylor Branch. Um, it's, it's set between 63 and 65, and so in 63 we are deep in uh, the famous and infamous and tragic uh, Freedom Summer in Mississippi in 1963. And then to close out, Selected Letters of Ralph Ellison, to kind of ease my mind on reading Sanctuary, I was spending some time in the different letters where Ellison just describes uh, with true appreciation the influence uh, Faulkner had on his own writing. And that was one of my windows into Invisible Man when I read that for the first time. And uh, it's, it's a book I dearly love. And so these letters have, have helped sort of amplify my appreciation for that. Now, off for the music. Uh, my wife has started a travel nursing position, uh, so we don't see her every day of the week because she's sometimes working um, at a hospital that's outside of our county. Uh, and so we're really hoping that is going well. But as part of that, um, when we first started dating, we, uh, we were long distance. And so um, we would make each other uh, CD mixes, even though iPods are on. We would send them to each other along with books in the mail. Um, <laughs> I'm very serious. And so um, I made, I did a throwback and made a mix. And on that are uh, Criminal from Fiona Apple, Control by Janet Jackson, and Loving Cup, her favorite Rolling Stones song, um, especially uh, with the departed Charlie Watts. So I hope everybody's, again, doing well in September. Uh, again, give me more recommendations on Dangerous Visions. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you.